afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming to listen to my session. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, myself and my team started uh, in 2018 um, working on the most trickiest um, problem in the, in the field of software development, as we believe, which is to detect, prioritize, and repair the worst case security vulnerabilities. So today, and after working deep down for two years, today we are happy to go out of the woods and uh, we are ready for the world to use our solution. So happy uh, to sign up for the beta testing. Um, just give me a moment. There is a hacker attack every 39 seconds. So when the average person takes a selfie and posts it in their uh, Instagram, it takes longer. So by that time, the hacker attack has already taken place. On 29th of July, 2019, uh, their fifth largest credit card issuer in the United States, Capital One Bank, stated that a hacker got access to 106 million customer records and made it publicly available. The alleged hacker, interestingly enough, Ms. Thompson, is a former employee of Amazon uh, Web Services. Why is it uh, important for that story? Simply because the Capital One decided to take all their ap software applications and move them to their Amazon Web Services. The process is to be completed in 2020. So the, uh, the decision was taken because of the legacy applications and uh, the bank uh, recognized that there will be a lot of uh, software vul vulnerabilities inside. So instead of really uh, spending lots of time on detecting them and repairing them, they decided just to bring in all legacy applications into probably uh, the most secure data center in the United States, not, not talking about the world. So, but the story shows that it's not enough. Of course, uh, <laughs> the alleged hacker should not have had their credentials, authentication credentials, to the network of Amazon Web Services uh, simply because she was ex-employee for three years already uh, before the attack happened. But unfortunately, uh, she had. But she wouldn't have been able to steal all these records wouldn't have been for their software vulnerability in the Capital One uh, web application firewall software. So which allowed her to trick the server and uh, run requests and get to, their, uh, to the data. So the question here, could have been this prevented? The answer is yes. Would have been the uh, machine learning detection run and scan that uh, legacy software and a repairment would, could have been done. May 24th, 2019, uh, the Fortune 500 uh, real, estate, uh, real estate insurance giant stated that 885 million sensitive mortgage documents got leaked into the public. So among those documents were um, like driving licenses of the real people, there were, there, uh, there were social security numbers, uh, there were account statements and bank transfers, and everything we, which you can imagine, which the, a typical person would need to apply a more for a mortgage. So what happened, uh, the problem was again, the software vulnerability on the website, and it's even uh, uh, <laughs> less uh, um, complex than the Capital One uh, problem. So what, what actually happens is that anyone can go and use the URL, manipulate the URL, and uh, get access without any authentication to any document on the website. So there, here there is an uh, easy example. So you see that uh, the URL uh, has in the end 1001, so it's a document ID. It's a purely designed URL, first of all. Uh, and uh, second, when, you're, when you type in that URL, uh, you should have access. So supposedly it's your document. Uh, but what you can do and what actually happened is uh, if you type ID like 1003, suddenly you get someone else's document. 
and you keep on manipulating. And so the result is 885 million records. Could it have been prevented? Yes. So if you would have run, again, the detection tools, uh, they, you would have found that vulnerability and that vulnerability could have been fixed. Uh, the result is there, as you could see, a reputational damage and uh, like lots of data breach costs. On top of that, 73% of black hat hackers said that traditional antivirus and firewall is irrelevant or obsolete. So such as, uh, such as their security. And here we're coming to the topic of AI. Attackers weaponize AI. So at the, at the bottom you see uh, there, there is a graph of AI productization. And here, uh, starting from about 2002, uh, there are major releases of the open source uh, libraries for the machine learning. So uh, coming up with 2018, TensorFlow libraries released and, uh, and further on. And on top of that, you see that hackers are closely following all innovation advances in the machine learning. So the first uh, uh, attacker toolkit uh, was probably in the 90s and now coming more and more sophisticated uh, toolkits which uh, allows the attacker to hide their tracks, to evade antivirus, to evade um, network intrusion detection systems and uh, really the, the <laughs> how can I say it, cherry or <laughs> top cherry is a fully automated exploit kit. So that kit, and I don't want to tell the name of it um, here, uh, but that kit allows uh, an attacker, even a rookie, just to uh, automatically uh, scan the targeted environment, automatically find uh, the vulnerability, escalate privilege rights, run uh, the exploit, which is exactly targeted for the specific vulnerability found, cover the tracks, and basically leave. So, AI weaponization. Here is one, um, one example of uh, how attackers um, can use AI model for fuzzing. Uh, fuzzing is very simple. Fuzzing is the vulnerability discovery technique uh, by feeding um, manipulated random and um, input into the software, uh, software program. So um, if you would imagine a hacker fuzzing Internet Explorer, so uh, they would probably take a, a Microsoft browser and run it into the, in the debugging mode uh, just to see every um, command, how it's indicated in a computer memory. And um, afterwards, they would probably point uh, the browser to their web server where the fuzzer is installed. And then the fuzzer would generate millions and millions of different web pages and uh, loading it into the browser and logging the results, trying to see where the browser would crash. And so after months and months of so activities, um, the hacker would, end, uh, would uh, finally get all the logs uh, with all inputs, inputs which crashed uh, the server, so the browser. And here you go. Now, <laughs> there is no need for months. There is a uh, fuzzing models uh, which contains basically two components. One component is a ML-based uh, vulnerability prediction component. And the second component is um, uh, ML-based uh, evolutionary fuzzer. So basically the first component uh, looks into a scanser software and sees uh, where the most likely the vulnerability is. And the second component leveraging this information on the found vulnerability and producing, generating the highly uh, uh, accurate input in order to send to the specific vulnerable parts of that software. So that saves like lots of computation resources, lots of time and efforts for the hacker to detect. This is just one example. And so talking about application security, where are the defenders? Defenders, are those are uh, SAS tools, so it's a static dynamic analysis tools, uh, which using like 10 year old scientific advances. Those are all commercial tools. So they are rule-based. So rule-based means that for every like vulnerability, you have to create a rule, and then this rule will be used to, to detect the vulnerability. 
as you can imagine, uh, that means that you have to have like uh, hundreds of cybersecurity experts and uh, they have to define uh, pro for every programming language those rules separately. And uh, they also um, are reactive because they're, <laughs> they're not uh, trying to imagine some rules. The rules coming after the attack successfully happened. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they're missing fr um, 60 to, to 90 percent uh, vulnerabilities in the code. And uh, of course, they cannot protect against their zero-day attacks. So zero-day means that uh, nobody knows about it. It's just the hacker knows who exploited it. And uh, they also do not provide automated uh, vulnerability remediation suggestions. What happens is that uh, the, the tool provides like 500 pages of results with lots of uh, false positive. False positive means that identified vulnerability, which is, uh, which is uh, not vulnerable. And then there is no, no, uh, no single fix. So what happens then is that there is a security consultants need to go through every single like page and uh, define whether it's real vulnerability and uh, suggest some code fix. So how it works. And I as you can imagine, uh, the cases like Capital One and uh, like uh, uh, financial first financial corporation, which I uh, discussed today, they are specifically happened also because of this kind of very manual process, very expensive, very time consuming. And so it was easier decision for the bank just to bring their uh, vulnerable application to the secure data center and hope nothing happens. So it's time to use AI to defend applications. So uh, we developed a solution uh, which is based on ML and deep learning, and I will share with you uh, today our road, uh, road, roadblocks and our experiences, how we uh, came to that solution. So until now, we analyzed uh, 90 million uh, commits, about 90 million. Um, we are updating the model uh, automatically from about 3,000 security databases wor worldwide. And uh, we also detect uh, vulnerabilities in the open source uh, code, and we provide the patches for that. So um, why open source is important? Um, there was some research done this year where uh, it, it said that 77% of enterprise application has some open source. This is not a secret that uh, many developers, <laughs> instead of writing from scratch, uh, just uses their open source libraries because they are really good. They, they bring lots of functionality, they, uh, they solve lots of business problems, and they're easy to deploy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they contain uh, the vulnerabilities, and some of them are known and even posted on their security databases. For some of them, and for many of them, there are already exploits uh, developed by hackers, which are also available free of charge, you would be surprised. Um, so you don't need even to be a hacker to, to copy-paste that code, compile it, and attack. So that's why the open source is important. We ran some, um, we ran some benchmarks, and uh, we arrived at um, to 10 times uh, higher accuracy in, in, uh, in detection. Just changing a bit of as a subject. Let's coming back to AI. To AI. What are common in a cat and a programming code? What do you think? Any suggestions? <laughs> I have <laughs> I have several answers uh, uh, from top of my head. So programmers like uh, like cats, love cats. Even the GitHub has a cat as a logo. Cybersecurity researchers also love cats uh, because when they are scanning the mobile devices and trying to find uh, their software, which will be used uh, to run a terror attack, they are finding frequently the cats on the mobile phones because uh, they're also innocent people who love cats. So this is the, uh, this is the two, um, two most obvious answers for me. But in the context of my today's presentation, I use it a bit differently. So here you will see uh, that um, both can be uh, used by deep learning networks, one for the image recognition or object detection tasks, like an uh, image cat, and the programming source code, which uh, we also wanted to, uh, uh, to, to, to detect vulnerabilities in using the deep learning networks. 
So what's the difference? If you uh, go into the image recognition task, um, you can uh, deploy the um, uh, you can deploy the uh, use the deep learning uh, because uh, in general there is a notion a so-called region proposal, and there is also there are structural uh, representation of images available such as the texture, edge, color. So this is how the deep learning can uh, uh, can actually be used to to detect the images. The previous speaker covered that uh, real well, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat uh, here. If you look into the programming source code, you know that there is no such a notion as a origin proposal, which can be used in order to uh, to pick up some parts of code and um, send it for the detection training. So what, what can be done here? So, okay, you can look into every function in the code and say, okay, this is my origin proposal. Would it be a, work, a working solution? Probably not. Uh, the reason for that is that vulnerabilities detection uh, is simply um, required also to uh, not only detect vulnerabilities, but also to pinpoint the location of the vulnerability. So it wouldn't be possible with a function. Another approach could be that you just take every line on, of code and just treat it as a region proposal. Would it work? Probably two, two big drawbacks on that. First of all, not each line of code is vulnerable, so the majority will be not. And the second of all, uh, they are used um, like separately and not in a whole context, which is also a problem. Therefore, uh, what we do is that we link their potentially uh, functions which display characteristics of vulnerabilities with all semantically related statements in the code backwards and forward and extract so-called small code gadgets. So here, this is how we deploy the um, region proposal notion into the field of the um, detection. So we started our journey uh, with uh, uh, reading through the, uh, lots of research papers. And uh, there are, uh, if you would be working in the uh, NLP research, for example, uh, for the last five years, you would see that there is not much progress uh, going on in comparison to the computer vision. As colleagues uh, mentioned, uh, the computer vision that had uh, ImageNet, which is more than one million uh, classified or labeled images available. It has the ImageNet uh, uh, contest. It also has um, uh, generative adversarial networks and many other advances. What happens in the uh, natural language processing, for a long time, it was nothing. So that was one of the researches which came across when we did our search. And uh, this was done by uh, Draper and Boston University, so the Americans. And uh, the research uh, has uh, uh, several breakthroughs. Uh, and one of them uh, would be that um, they showed a great potential of using the deep learning networks for the detection. And, that, uh, and they showed it by uh, comparing the results and benchmark it against the traditional uh, static analysis tools, rule-based, and they showed that uh, they absolutely outperformed uh, the rule-based solution. Second uh, big advantage was that if you, if you know and if you ever used uh, static analysis tools, you would see that um, this is always predefined fixed findings uh, which those tools uh, produce. So if you have a large uh, code set, uh, you code repository, you may have too many findings. If you have a smaller um, uh, repository, uh, then it could be uh, too small findings for critical applications. So it's not very flexible. Another advantage is that machine learning outputs, as you know, it's always um, creates outputs with probabilities. So it means that you can always tune uh, the results uh, into your desired, uh, like into your desired KPIs. So if you want to to see only higher confidence, uh, like almost 99% um, confident, confident uh, true positives, then you may tune it like this. If you want to observe how many potentially less uh, important or less uh, critical problems exist, you can just change the KPI and put it into less, less confidence. And uh, another point which is really what they proved is 
um, they, using the machine learning, they can also use the machine learning visualization techniques, like feature activation map, for example, in order to explain uh, their decision of the, of the, of the network. So we reproduced the, uh, their model, and uh, their best model they had, they tried with the different ones. They, they tried with a convolutional neural network. They tried with a recurrent neural network. That's the best one. So this is the LX source code into, um, into uh, sequence tokens. Uh, they uh, embed it into representation. They filtered by number of convolutional layers, and uh, then they maxed pulled and um, learned source features they uh, used as an input and uh, thrown it into the random uh, forest classifier. That was the best model which produced uh, the, the most accurate results. So the limitation of that uh, research is that they treated functions in the code separately. So it's only syntax. There was no semantics applied to it. Uh, therefore, this, uh, this has a, a certain limitation. And we compared it uh, to our model where, as mentioned, uh, we, we extract not just uh, functions but also all semantically related statements and uh, we got to, uh, to these KPIs. For the non-scientists non here, this is a very simple matrix. So for example, MCC, this is a Matthews correlation uh, coefficient and basically uh, the, co uh, the correlation between their uh, target and predictions. So the higher the um, the correlation, the more accurate the, the model. Similar goes with uh, F1 precision and recall. So if you, if you compare that MCC of uh, uh, Draper was about uh, 50%, uh, we achieved 90 and, uh, and so with others as well. To achieve better results, uh, we added code semantics. So what it means? It means that on a parsing level, uh, we uh, produce the multi-layered code representation. And our multi-layered uh, code representation uh, depicts uh, control flow graphs, call graphs, um, uh, product depe uh, program dependency graphs, and uh, uh, directory structures. And uh, uh, it also includes the raw programming code, so the custom code, the open source um, libraries, and um, including the um, classes uh, and functions and fields and um, abstract syntax trees all merged into the joint uh, data structure for further analysis. And uh, this input uh, sent for the detection training allows uh, really uh, the, the model to really deeply understand all data flows in the program, which of course um, increases, uh, decreases the false positive, false negatives and increases the accuracy of the prediction. So here uh, we achieved uh, 10 times better on false negative rate. False negative is the vulnerabilities which are naturally missed by um, detection tools. Uh, false positive rates about seven times better and uh, there is other KPIs here as well. But it's not enough just to detect vulnerability. It's uh, certainly required to remediate vulnerability or repair vulnerability as soon as possible. It took uh, an average of 38 days for an organization in 2018 to remediate vulnerability. And um, we, just, we ask ourselves the question, uh, can we provide the developer with a um, remediation suggestion at coding phase in real time? And we thought we, we could. That's how we did it. So as, as mentioned, uh, for the many years, there were no really uh, real progress or breakthroughs in the area of natural language processing, uh, which is very close to, to the vulnerability detection because it's also, it's also text, even uh, though programming code is, of course, uh, different from the natural language, but it's the closest possible. So if you look into, uh, into that, uh, you would see that uh, the big breakthrough, which happened in the natural language, uh, language processing field, uh, happened due to the Google releasing their sequence-to-sequence -sequence transformer architecture in summer 2017 in their research paper, which is called Attention is All You Need. So in this paper, they, um, the researchers uh, proved that uh, transformer outperforms traditional convolutional neural network and uh, a recurrent neural network on the task of uh, English to German, English to French translation, and also on some other tasks. And... Um, 
how can we apply, how can we formulate um, remediation problem in, problem in a way that it could be like similar to, to the task of the natural language processing. And the closest what we've done is that we said, okay, the closest task would be error correction uh, task. So we, could, we treat our bad vulnerable um, source code as an incorrect sentence. And then we treat the corrected with a fixed patch sentence as a corrected sentence. So a code to is a corrected sentence. So it's a, a grammar error correction task for us when we, uh, uh, when we uh, convert it into the na natural language representation. So before we started, we started looking into uh, advances in data architecture and um, what, what other applications uh, that um, the, it, it was uh, applied. And uh, Transformer was really great in like text generation tasks and uh, into others. The key to success here is uh, a so-called self-attention mechanism. Self-attention mechanism is a very simple thing. That's how your brain works as well. Uh, when you read, for example, a word, in your memory, you always have the keywords or the context from what you already read. So your, your brain automatically knows where to focus on and uh, what comes in the, in, in the next. So self-attention. Next, we came uh, to, um, to another interesting application, which is very promising. And this is the first application probably, which, uh, uh, which he was using Transformer and more closely GPT-2 uh, grammar model for the code auto-completion. So code auto-completion is uh, simply a task which allows the developer to quickly complete the code and provides it with a uh, like deep learning completion. And uh, in the meantime, this really works well for about 15 languages, and this is more or less like programming language agnostic. So for us, it was uh, uh, interesting to find out because uh, that showed that uh, this type of models can be really deployed to the field of the programming language. So we were on the right, right track. Our first model, uh, we, we decided to start with a transformer model called BIART. BIART is bidirectional encoder um, uh, uh, repo repositories, I think, uh, which, is, uh, which is used for transformer. It's a simplified uh, method because it only has encoder layers. And we, d we, we decided that uh, the ideal way we don't need to apply it in a way like auto-completion so that the model learns only the next word or the next uh, token. We need to train it to learn the complete patch, the complete fix. So it means that uh, at the end, uh, the model should have generated the synthetic code to repay the vulnerability completely. So it's a, it's a very uh, ambitious task. And uh, I should tell on this point, we failed. What happened to it is that uh, we tried to um, change the architecture. We added more hidden layers. We added more parameters to make the, uh, the model more robust. Um, we still understood that the mod model wasn't uh, learning uh, really good. So it wasn't trained well. And then we decided that uh, we need to decrease the level of complexity for the model. And uh, we did it by uh, only feeding in the small code fixes, meaning that if you can imagine, sometimes to, to fix a problem, you only need to just probably change one line of code. Sometimes you need to rewrite like completely, completely file, like 90%. So we took only our small changeable code, so like 10% or 50%, feed it into, uh, into the model in order to, uh, for it to, to reduce complexity and start learning. Did it help? Yes, it did. But it was only working really for the really simplest code fixes. And uh, even though the, the probably 10% of the vulnerabilities patches would be really uh, big changes, still there are something in between 10 and 90. So we understood that uh, we need to do something else and uh, we continued. So what we did is that we decided to drop the notion that we would uh, train the model to learn the complete, uh, complete code fix and we will train it only to uh, learn a next token. 
So similar as uh, what you saw out the completion does. So just just simply one token at a time, and then uh, that that would be uh, that would be working. Yes, we saw uh, straight away the great progress with that approach. So the model started training. Uh, our validation loss uh, also was really great, and we couldn't believe our eyes. So um, here, what you see, uh, this is the. Uh, sorry. So basically, uh, here we had um, that the video wouldn't start. But uh, the, the thing is that that uh, this was the transpose matrix which we used as, a, as the decoder layers in order to um, to for the model to only uh, send one token at a time. And it was supposed to see only uh, then uh, predict the next token. What happened with that model, and you could see it here, is that unfortunately, due to the bug which we found afterwards in the PyTorch library, the model cheated. So instead of uh, learning to predict the next token, it simply saw the next token. And that's why the result was so great, yes. And when we went into, uh, into the prediction, that was a complete disaster and just a garbage out. So as you could see, zero tokens. However, what we've done is that uh, we debugged then uh, two PyTorch versions separately and uh, to find out the problem. And we found out that that matrix was the, pro uh, the problem, transpose was the problem. So we fixed that. And after countless uh, uh, other problems and fixes, uh, at least uh, we, we came to the efficient model, which uh, working as it's supposed to work. So as you could see here, there is uh, all tokens coming, but it does not uh, see all tokens up front. So only uh, what, what it should be, kind of what was already learned. And with that, finally, we got to the great results. So for us, uh, and probably what we also introduced is a rel relative and absolute validation error. So uh, for absolute error, we calculate as a percentage of tokens which uh, were not um, predicted correctly, so which were, which were predicted with errors. And uh, also we um, put a notion as a required change. Required change is percent of, ch of tokens which uh, uh, between the uh, good version, so the, the patched version and the vulnerable version. And then the relative uh, percent, uh, we calculated as absolute error divided by the required change. So the less percentage is the better, obviously, but this is our, our latest achievement which we got and which we are very proud of to present today. So it's how it looks. It's a very simple uh, interface. So you could scan the, the code and uh, that will be highlighted. The problem uh, and uh, the classification would be given. For the classification, we, we use the industry standards, which are called um, categorization, which called uh, common weaknesses and exposures, CWE here. 119 is an example. This is a buffer overflow. So it's a type of memory corruption, pro corruption problem. And also you could get the uh, code fix automatically. You could uh, edit the file in the editor and you could send it again for the vulnerability detection so that uh, you could see whether it's fixed or not. So with, we are, what we're trying to achieve and uh, I think we will succeed is to give the developer a tool uh, that he can use at coding phase to fix and find and fix vulnerabilities before it happens that uh, they are exploited in the production. And with that, I thank you all for your attention. And if you are interested to test our tool, please feel free uh, to write us an email or please feel free, feel free just to come over to me. I'm here for two days and uh, yes. So thank you for your attention.